Rishi Sunak's Rwanda plan cleared its first major hurdle in the House of Lords last night, but not without facing some heavy criticism from its members. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, made a rare intervention into politics by speaking out in the Lords' chamber and condemning the Prime Minister's pick-and-choose approach to international law. We can, as a nation, do better than this bill. With this bill, the government is continuing to seek good objectives in the wrong way, leading the nation down a damaging path. It is damaging for asylum seekers in need of protection and safe and legal routes to be heard. Well, joining me now in the studio to discuss this, Talk TV political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald. Hi, Alicia, good to see you. And Times columnist Hugo Rifkind. Hello, Hugo, Hi. thank you for coming. So I suppose one of the questions is, let's start with Hugo on this one, is it, does it behove the, the, the Archbishop of Canterbury to pitch in on matters political? And if it doesn't, what's he doing in the House of Lords? That's the whole question. Look, on the one hand, it is sort of remarkable that you have somebody with that position in the Church of England attacking the government in the House of Lords. Mm. On the other hand, if he's not going to do that, why even have him there? The yeah. point of having uh, the, the Lord's spiritual is to bring a spiritual religious dimension to the House of Lords. And when that spiritual religious dimension is deemed to disagree with government policy, they should be there to say so. I mean, well be on the same basis, pretty well, not precisely the same basis, but on a religious basis, disagreed with equal marriage, for example. He opposed that in the House of Lords in the same kind of way. The House of Lords doesn't have a veto on government policy, so the function of him is to make this kind of intervention. If he thinks something goes against his principles, what he believes to be the church's principles, he should say so. Alistair, I suppose some people might think that the Lord spiritual are really there only to opine on spiritual matters. So if it's something to do with female clergy, if it's something to do with gay marriage being celebrated in church, if it's something to do with the liturgy, something ecclesiastical, you know, something that's religious, then OK, all right, we want to hear from the Archbishop of Canterbury. But if it's not, if it's something political like the Rwandan scheme, he should just butt out of that and leave that to the politicians. And, and that's partly, I suppose, this kind of sense of um, indignation that does seem to have erupted. People very annoyed with him for saying anything at all. Definitely, but sadly, it just doesn't work like that. If you are a member of the House of Lords, you have the right to speak about anything that comes your way. You're well within your right to stand up in any of the any of the debates and put your opinion forward. There are 26 uh, bishops in the House of Lords, and that's been a really controversial thing for a while. Lots of people have been campaigning to actually get them out of the House of Lords. That's because it's only the UK and Iran who actually have any <laughs> spiritual figures in our parliamentary system, which is is quite in insane when you look at that. You think of every single country, it's. Quite quite a, a strange process and I think lots of people think that. It started centuries ago when Christianity played such a role in everyone's lives, whereas nowadays you could argue it probably plays a role in a small percentage of the UK population's lives. So it kind of just opens that wider debate on why do we have bishops there, should we, and should something really change? All right, well, I'm going to quote Pinocchio here and, and uh, the Disney version, of course, the only really decent version of Pinocchio, Hugo Rifkin, where Jiminy Cricket's there because he's there to be your conscience and always let your conscience be your guide. Is the presence of the of the Lord spiritual really nothing to do with Christianity or specific religion or anything to do with multiculturalism or anything like that? It's just to be the conscience of the nation that they are supposed to have a kind of acute moral sense, you'd hope so if you're an archbishop, for God's sake, some idea of what's right and wrong, and that you would be selfless rather than selfish, and you would, you know, you would respond to the good inclination rather than the evil inclination, and that you would wake that up in the rest of the country. And so, you know, if, if it is felt by many or some that the Rwanda solution is a pretty unpleasant idea, an unkind idea, and inhumane, who better than an archbishop to say so? Sure. I mean, I'd imagine if Welby feels he is unable to square support for the Rwanda policy with the things he'd say from the pulpit, mm. then, then his role is to say so. And I mean, look, if you've got uh, any chamber of, 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 uh, of parliament, if you're allowed to agree with something, you're also allowed to disagree with it. That's what voting is. Mm. So if he's there to vote at all, he's allowed to do either, I would have thought. I mean, I agree that the fact that he's there at all is increasingly preposter preposterous, as is the rest of the House of Lords, really. I mean, you can make a decent case that none of them should be there. We should have a whole different, com completely different, strange situation. But while we have this archaic chamber that keeps doing its archaic things, 
I don't think we can be surprised if he behaves like that. Except in this is some people are very grateful for the House of Lords. They might not like the way it's composed. They might not like a certain sense of droit de seigneur. They might not like the sort of hereditary element of it. They also might not like the partisan party political element either, or the preferment, or all the other things. I've got to make a terrible case for it really here. <laughs> absolutely appalling. They'll, so they'll, they'll let you they're, in eventually. They're, they're a mess. Oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Many, many things that lots of people from all different positions in the community dislike about it. And yet, sometimes, isn't it true that the country collectively feels grateful for the break that the House of Lords seems to put on the most galloping, runaway, you might say madcap, if you read that kind of comic when you were a child, <laughs> but the kind of madcap ideas that might, without the House of Lords, just come, come, you know, erupting through? For sure, it's by no means a one-sided argument. I mean, the Labour Party for a long time have said they'd plan to abolish the House of Lords, but kind of logistically, it's a really hard thing to do. What do you replace it with? We currently have, the way our legislation works, we've seen that very highly demonstrated with the Rwanda bill that we've seen go through the Commons and now in the House of Lords. The way our legislation works is with that extra element of scrutiny from this second chamber. So if you do abolish it, the question then is, what do you replace it with? You can't feasibly have two like elected chambers in the exact same way that we do with the House of Commons. Obviously, you can look at other countries. America, for example, they have a different model. Maybe we could try and mirror that. But lots of people aren't happy with the model in America either. So it's definitely a two-sided thing. Lots of people don't agree with the House of Lords. But the question is, what do you then replace it with if we do replace it?